Okay, uh, let's get us started and then uh, people can join. I uh, assume there, everybody is watching uh, African Soccer League or something, but uh, that's that's fine. So uh, uh, the the, the uh, lecture will be recorded and it will be posted. So for for the students who are missing, they, they will have the chance to come back and see the slides. So to just, uh, again, uh, let me know if you have any questions, but uh, please keep the questions uh, till end, but you can type the questions in the, in the chat room, in the Q&A, and uh, I'll start basically responding those chat, those uh, questions in the chat after we are done with the, with the lecture. So uh, to just uh, recap uh, what we did uh, last uh, Tuesday, we started with the discussion of uh, why the geothermal energy is important, why we are uh, doing all these activities right now. And uh, we, let's see. And then we started uh, discussing different types of uh, geothermal systems. Uh, we said there are traditional or conventional geothermal system that we are tapping into the um, hot aquifers and we are using the hot water or steam coming out of the hot aquifers uh, to generate heat and for both uh, direct use or generating the electricity. And then we said there is a closed loop system, which is basically uh, can be done in the areas close to the volcanics. But in this case, uh, the, the fluid is not actually leaving the well board. Okay, so if the fluid will stay in the well board and we are injecting the cold fluid through the tubing through the uh, casing, and then we are producing the hot fluid through the tubing. And this could be uh, vice versa, depending on what type of fluid we are injecting, it could be different. You could, if the injected fluid could be through the tubing and then produced through the casing or injected through the casing, produced through the tubing. And then we said uh, there is another type of uh, uh, geothermal systems, which we call it hot dry rock geothermal system, which uh, in this case, uh, basically we are just looking at the temperature gradient of the earth. We are just trying to find where we can get the uh, best temperature gradient. And in that case, we are drilling wells. And then what when we drill the wells, we try to frack the wells to uh, start this communication between the wells. And then we are injecting fluid in one well and then producing from the other well. This also can be done in a single well, which we will go over the discussion of that uh, shortly. And the uh, fourth uh, geothermal system was the case that which basically we use the, uh, we can use the huff and puff. This is very similar to what we use in the oil and gas industry in the steam stimulation when we are injecting uh, steam to heavy oil reservoirs. We shut the well, we let the steam to soak into the reservoir, drop the viscosity of oil and produce. Here we are going to perform something similar to that, injecting into the single well, shut the well, let the water get into the formation, warmed up, and then uh, producing the warmed water back. In, in cycles, basically, this can be done you know, using multiple wells to just make sure that we have a continuous production. In terms of the applications, I said we could have both applications of the direct or electricity generation. In the direct, we're just using directly, we are using the heat that we get out of the formation. In the electricity generation, we convert the heat to the electricity and then we use the electricity. And then uh, we said there are two types of uh, application. It could be binary organic uh, raking cycle, in which we said in the case of binary, generally the temperatures are less than 200 degrees Celsius. And uh, in this case, we need to have a working fluid, additional fluid with the boiling point of less than water to be used to transfer the geothermal energy. And if the temperature is high enough, it's more than 200 degrees Celsius, then we are using the flash plants, which basically uses the pressure and the temperature of the steam or the hot water that's been, the hot water or steam that's been generated. And uh, 
we stopped at this point where we said any one of these systems, the hydrothermal or conventional geothermal, the closed loop or near hydrothermal EGS or deep uh, EGS uh, enhanced geothermal systems, they can be in flash or binary, depending on the temperature of the producing fluid. Okay, and we stop here. So uh, the discussion today is actually continues on that, and we are going to look at these four different uh, geothermal systems. But before going to that, we just wanted to look at the historical trend and current estimates and uh, future projections for the capital expenditures on this geothermal system. And uh, if you remember from our previous discussion, we said for any energy source development, uh, one of the most important thing is the cost. And in the cost, we introduced a couple of factors. We introduced the capex, the capital expenditures, the total amount of money that we are putting uh, right at the beginning of the investment. And then OPEX, which is basically operational and maintenance cost. And we said all these can be summarized in a parameters like uh, level of levelized cost of energy LCOE or levelized levelized cost of uh, energy storage and uh, we are using those to make the comparison so currently this data shows the change in the capex capital expenditures in terms of dollars per kilowatt of energy produced from the geothermal systems and it shows that how this has been changed through the years and what is the projection? So as you can see here, the uh, the cost in let's say in 2017 is something around in average around uh, four thousand dollars initial investment per kilowatt of energy produced. Looking at the LCOE numbers, uh, what we can see is that. The LCA number for the 2017, the median is $82 per megawatt hour of the energy. Okay. And obviously, this value changes, goes up and down. And there are predictions that uh, tries to decrease this cost and projects it to 2050. To just give you again an idea of uh, Uh, from the idea of what uh, these numbers mean, again, we're going to go back to our table that we discussed previously. And uh, this table was showing the LCOE or the LCOS cost of the energy production or energy storage per technology. And as you can see, uh, the geothermal is estimated to be 39.82, or in 2017, the value was, uh, and the median was about $82. And the minimum was is 24. So, so this basically gives us an overview of what we are looking and what we are comparing. So we are comparing the geothermal with the other source of energy. And we just wanted to make sure that both based on the capacity and based on the LCOE and LCOS, it's comparable or it can compete with other source of the energies. Looking at the investments in this, uh, and as we again, as we discussed before, this is not something new. The, the investment uh, on the US installed uh, capacity of operation plant started from 1971, basically from 1971, we see investment in the geothermal. So it is stayed kind of constant for a while. And then from 1980s to 1989, there is there was a huge jump in investment and study on uh, geothermal systems. And this is basically shows the megawatt energy uh, basically produced for, for this period of time. And then we had a kind of a silence and a slight increase in the investments from in 1990s and then from 2000 to 2010. And again, we see starting investment and jump and increase in the investment in the geothermal system, which basically shows how this uh, has been developed, this technology through years 
from back going back to 1971. But uh, according to the DOE forecast, the uh, geothermal uh, power could provide about 57% uh, of the base load renewable energy generation portfolio by 2050, which basically makes up to 20.4% of all the renewable energy generation. Okay. Again, this basically compares at the stand of the different renewable energies, um, like wind, like solar, like biopower, hydropower, using the PVs, which is materials that are absorbing the uh, sun heat, and then they can generate the electricity. So it basically shows all these and it shows how the forecast is for these developments. Okay, which again, you can see the majority goes to the uh, wind and the PV, but the geothermal starts picking up and actually takes the 20% by 2050. Uh, this by itself, uh, uh, this, this, is, this is a very good graph, but again, we need to remember that the whole uh, renewable energy is taking only less than 20% of total energy demand by the 2030 and 2054. So, so this is basically something that we need to uh, pay attention. And uh, this, we had the, the details discussions earlier in our previous uh, lecture, which you can go and uh, check the numbers. But we just wanted to make sure that uh, we know in what landscape we are talking, how much of the energy we are expecting and uh, what portion of from the renewables and what portion of that is coming and is expected to coming from the geothermal energies. And this is basically showing that the application of this, uh, which is basically 55% uh, goes to the residentials, 24% industry, 21% on the commercial sense. Okay. Uh, Looking at the geothermal energy systems, uh, the, the first one and the oldest one and most and the one that we see, which is actually uh, working in application generating energy for the for the US is the traditional or conventional geothermal. Okay, so we did say that the uh, before the geothermal energy is the natural heat of the earth. Okay, so Deeper we go, the hotter it gets. And deeper we drill, we can access to the more heat and then that can be used for the uh, applications. The traditional or conventional geothermal, most really related to the volcanic areas, okay? Or a very highly fractured areas connected to these uh, hot regions like volcanics. Okay. There are areas which are not volcanic, but they're highly fractured, which they can reach to the deeper formations with a very high temperature. Okay. That can be also considered. But uh, in the case of traditional or, con or conventional geothermal systems, we're talking about the systems that we are going to produce heat from the hotted aquifers, from the water, underground water and a very hot at aquifers and extract the heat from those resources. So just uh, going back to the, our uh, geology 101, uh, you know, the earth involves the crust, which is basically solid. And uh, then we have the mantle, which is again, solid. We go to the outer core, which is a liquid like, and then we go to the inner core, which is believed to be solid. And, uh, how do we come up with these? Uh, mostly through the seismics. So through the travel time of the seismic waves, uh, people, they found that, the scientists found that the, the inner core uh, is solid. It's, it's a dense solid and the outer core is uh, liquid-like and uh, the rest. So here we have the expectations on based on the depths and range of the temperatures that we expect from different locations okay so oceans eight kilometers cross-continental goes to 32 
kilometers. So we are we are drilling very in a small portion of it right here in the range that if you we would happy if we can get the 200 degrees C, 300 degrees C of the temperature in the volcanic areas. Uh, and again, to just give you a perspective, the majority of the oil and gas wells, even in this, uh, in the unconventional sense, they are going all the way to 10,000 feet, you know, 13,000 feet. These are these are the ranges, but uh, the the longest uh, and the deepest well uh, is drilled in northwest Russia, uh, and uh, which is basically called the world's deepest human-made hole with the 12,262 meters. So even with the, with the deeper one, we are in that temperature range. Okay. But uh, why, how these temperatures, uh, high temperatures are getting in contact with the aquifers and with the formations at the shallower depth? This is simply uh, due to the fact that the earth crust uh, is broken into huge plates, okay? Uh, these are called earth's tectonic plates, okay? So, which basically is shown here. These are different earth, uh, let me see if you, uh, laser pointer, okay. So these are, uh, these are our uh, tectonic plates, okay? These are the tectonic plates. So the earth cross has been divided to multiple one of these tectonic plates. These tectonic plates, they move, okay? They move apart or they push together, okay? Why? Because of the convection of uh, that semi-molten rock in the upper mantle, that basically helps these tectonic plates to move around, okay? And when... Uh, these tectonic plates hit each other, one plate pushes the other one, okay? Or it slides beneath another one, okay? So when one plate slides beneath another plate, then what happens, the plumes of magma rises from the edge of this sinking plate, okay? So basically then when the magma comes up, then it basically brings a very, very high temperature and it gets in contact with the other sources and the formations at the, at the top, okay? Uh, it, it's very important that uh, we know that the, the rate of these movements are, are very different at different locations, okay? And uh, these are generally a few centimeter per year, Okay, it would be the uh, the movement of these plates, and even that few centimeters per year can can result in major earthquakes that we see in different part of the world. And these are basically where uh, these events are basically due to those movements. So when this happens, what we'll see at the surface, uh, we'll see different source of uh, traditional or conventional uh, geothermal resources, uh, like uh, geysers. Okay, so geysers uh, these are uh, these are rare kind of hot spring, uh, which are under the pressure. Okay, and these are under the pressure, so they erupt water. They are sending jets of water and steam into the air. Okay. These geysers are made from a tube-like hole in the Earth's surface that runs deep into the uh, deep into the crust. So it's it goes deep into the crust, and by this high pressure, high temperature, it just basically sends jets of the hot water and steam out of the ground. So this basically shows that, that there is a huge potential to reach these uh, high temperature water and the steam at the geysers. The, the second uh, type of the uh, hot spring, the traditional geothermal resources, there is the hot springs, like the ones that we have in the Yellowstone, uh, Montana. So a hot spring, uh, or what people call hydrothermal spring or geothermal spring, uh, 
Also, is a spring produced by the emergence of the geothermally heated groundwater onto the surface of the earth. Okay, so again, those waters, the groundwaters that's been warmed up uh, due to contact with the uh, volcanic uh, activities, then they, they come to the surface and they present at the hottest springs, which again generates a huge source of the thermal energy to be harvested. And uh, the next type of uh, these traditional or conventional geothermal resources are the fumaroles. Fumaroles uh, are winds, simply. So uh, sometimes uh, in a volcanic area, this picture like taken from the airplane, obviously, so they can see the steam coming out of the mountains, okay? So these winds or openings at the surface of the brings the volcanic gases and the vapors and everything to the surface. Again, showing another areas with a high potential for harvesting the geothermal and uh, uh, energies. And the convention, the, the uh, conventional traditional geothermal reservoirs, where basically they don't have much of the appearance at the surface, but they are. Uh, they are shallow enough to drill a well and tap into this uh, hot water formations and uh, produce the hot water from the hot aquifers. Where the water comes from, the water is simply coming from the rainwaters that passes through the natural fractures. These areas are generally involved with the faults, with the major faults that... Uh, and these faults are simply permeable faults that basically lead the water to get into the deep of the formations, warmed up, and then it basically generates the possibility for us to simply drill a well, drill a production well, and produce from these hot waters. Generally, the way it works is after identifying these aquifers, these geothermal reservoirs with the hot water, we set the power plants on the top of it. We drill the production wells and we drill the injection well. So from the production well, we are producing the hot water. It goes to the power plant. And when it comes up, it goes to the turbine. It moves the turbine. Turbine generates the electricity. And then the cold water goes to the injection well and we are injecting back the cold water to the formation to keep the formation or the reservoir pressure, okay? So this is basically how the conventional or traditional geothermal system works. Uh, this conventional term or hydrothermal systems, they face uh, key limitations. Uh, firstly, they require high subsurface permeability for water flow through hot rock, okay? Because remember, in this case, we are not fracking. We are not doing anything. We are just tapping into the uh, hot aquifer by drilling a well, okay? So that aquifer should have enough natural fracture system or permeability to generate enough water flow for us to produce, okay? And uh, the other thing is the, the volume of the processed water. There is a huge volume of the processed water that we need to handle. And some of the waters, uh, we need that huge processed water amount to get the enough energy to make things uh, economically viable. But uh, one other thing is some of these waters, they might uh, get lost through the natural fracture systems. So we might need to also provide additional water, some what we call it makeup water, to come up with that loss of water into the fractures, okay? And then the effectiveness of the, effectiveness of the heat extraction from this reservoirs directly correlates to the uh, water flow between the injection and the production well, okay, at the given temperature. 
2022, uh, the United States had uh, geothermal power plants in seven states, which basically produced about 0.4% of total U.S. utility scale electricity generation. Okay. Uh, these uh, stations are uh, mainly in California. Okay. California leads the United States in the geothermal electricity generation. Then Nevada is another significant contributor to geothermal electricity. Hawaii, it, it has geothermal plants on the big islands. Idaho, and again, this is the state that uses the, um, for the electricity generation and Alaska. So Alaska also taps into these geothermal resources for the electricity generation. So these are the major ones. And uh, again, if, if we look at the map of the identified hydrothermal sites, and uh, we can see that most of them are located here, right, under the west, on the west side. And uh, these are basically where most of the activities regarding the geothermal is happening. So in this graph, these are the most uh, favorable shown with the hot uh, red color. And then when you go away from that, you get to the least and least favorable areas. So the project that we are running currently at West Virginia, as again, again, you can see that in this side, in this part of the US, we don't have much of the hot colors, but there are some in these areas, especially in, the, in West Virginia, we can have some spots that, uh, that we are actually investigating to produce the uh, geothermal, but not the uh, traditional geothermal. And again, this map uh, shows, uh, based on the temperature, how the temperature gradient is distributed. Obviously, the temperature gradient is, uh, is a function of depth. So this graph is generated for 5.5 kilometer, okay? Uh, depth. So at 5.5 kilometer depth, this is basically how the temperature is distributed across the United States. There is one thing that we need to remember about this, and that is how these temperatures has been measured. Uh, it, for example, in the oil and gas industry, when we are running the uh, logging, well logs, we are measuring the temperatures. And uh, this is basically a point temperature. And we just need to remember that this temperature has been taken uh, while we were running the well logs, which is most probably ran through the drilling fluid. So in most of the cases, this temperature that we're collecting underestimates the actual temperature gradient. And this is basically what we have seen in, in our current projects. Basically, what we did, we ran the, we, we measured the temperature while we were doing the well logging in the well. And then we went back two months later and ran another temperature log. So, and then we compared these two. And then we went another three, two months later and we ran another temperature log. And then six months later, another temperature log. So we compared these uh, temperature logs and we see that the, the trends are kind of similar, but uh, the values are not. So as we waited longer and longer, the temperature actually has gone higher and higher, okay? So we get a higher temperature. So let's say if we were expected to have, let's say 200 degree Fahrenheit at let's say 13,000 feet, we got the 200 degree Fahrenheit and 10,000 feet already, okay, after six months. So this is something that we need to think about. And the other thing that we need to think about, this was a question last uh, session too, the, the relationship between the temperature gradient and the depth is not just based on the temperature gradient and the depth. It's not just, let's say, one degree Fahrenheit per 100 feet. It also depends on the lithology of the formation. So different, we know the from the surface as we go down we have different type of formations you might have shale shaley formation you might have sandstone you might have dolomite you might have calcite carbonate you might have shaley sandstone combination of these gypsum and all that anhydrite 
So different type of formation will generate different temperature gradient. And we can see that by simply correlating the temperature gradient log with the lithology log. And then this basically shows that how these temperature gradients are changing and actually the change is significant when we are looking at the correlation between temperature gradient and the lithology. So uh, this, is, this is just a quick uh, wrap up about the uh, conventional geothermal systems. We get into the details of uh, this in the in next week on uh, on the actual projects when we basically look at one project and we explore how the specific of that project looks like. What type of drilling we're going to use? What type of completion? How we're going to process this? But that, but this week we are just going to focus on the definitions and looking at the general aspects of the geothermal. Uh, the Second type of the uh, geothermal systems, as we said, is the closed loop geothermal resources, okay? The closed loop geothermal resources, uh, they can be, uh, they are divided in two categories. It could be shallow closed loop system, okay? Or deep closed loop system. So in shallow closed loop systems, uh, or it's called geothermal heat pumps, or sometimes referred to the geo exchange or earth coupled ground source or water source heat pump, these uh, these are these resources and um, have been used uh, since the nineteen forties. Okay, these are very shallow wells, tens of feet deep. Okay, from the ground surface. Uh, the range might be roughly 50 to 60 feet, uh, 60 de uh, degree Fahrenheit, okay, the range of the temperature for, for these type of depths. And then we have the deep closed loop system, which basically we are drilling thousands of feet, tens of thousands of the feet of the well bore, and then we are exploring these closed loop systems. So there are two types of them. It could be the shallow one, could be simply four feet, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 300 feet under the ground, or it could be a deep one going to 20,000 feet, 15,000 feet down the ground, okay? So in the case of the shallow loop geothermal reservoirs, uh, there are four types of those. These could be horizontal, they could be vertical, they could be drilled to the ponds or lakes as a closed loop system, or they could be open loop system, okay? We'll go through this. We will see what do we mean by the closed loop system and what, we, what do we mean by the open. Most of, uh, most closed loop geothermal heat pumps uh, these are the cases that we are circulating an antifreeze solutions through a closed buried uh, pipelines, either in the under the ground or submerged in the water. Okay, and then a heat exchanger is used to transfer the heat between that uh, refrigerant and antifreeze solution in the closed loop. Okay. This is how it's looked like. Let's say uh, 10 feet under the ground, say on a shallow ground, generally the temperature is constant, okay? On a shallow ground, generally the temperature is constant. It's, let's say it's around 40, 54 degree Fahrenheit, okay? So uh, the idea is in the horizontal, uh, closed loop system, okay? This can be designed for houses. Actually, it's been used for the houses. There is there is a nice YouTube by the DOE if you just uh, search, and I, I borrowed these images from that as well. If, if you look at it, it basically shows you the, the excavation, pipe installation, and then how the system works to heat up uh, a house or a church 
or a stadium in a bigger bigger scale. But uh, in the horizontal installation, uh, this is often uh, the most economical choice for residential setups, okay? And this is good, especially for the new constructions, okay, where you have sufficient lab. Let's say you have a backyard or you have a big parking, you know, space uh, that you can excavate and you can place these uh, pipelines. And the installation involves the digging of uh, trenches that are at least four feet deep. So you want it to be at least four feet deep. Let's say 10 feet deep you want to go. And then when you go four to 10 feet down, uh, the common configuration includes using two pipes, okay? One that's buried at six feet and the other one at four feet. Okay, so this is one, one configuration. So with, with, with the spacing, or uh, we can place these two side by side. So one could be at the top and one could be at the bottom, six feet and the four feet, or they could boost, they can they can be side by side on a six feet deep. Okay. And then what you do, you basically you, you inject, you inject that uh fluid, the antifreeze fluid that goes to this, goes to the pipeline, goes down. And then it gets in contact with the formation, goes to the second loop, goes to the in contact the formation, goes to the third loop, goes to the contact, and then comes back. And then it will be produced from the second well. And it goes to the heat exchanger. And the heat exchanger, it exchanges heat, and then heat will be used to heat the form to heat the house. So it really depends. If you are in the winter. So the temperature outside is much colder than the temperature under the ground, okay? In this case, what you can do, the cold temperature will cool down the antifreeze fluid. The antifreeze fluid will pump into the loop under the ground. It warms up because the under the ground is warmer than outside during the winter. And then it brings the heat to the surface, to the heat exchanger, and then warms up the house. If you are in the summer, then in the summer, the outside temperature is warmer than the underground temperature. Then the, the system is working in a reverse. So the hotted fluid will goes down in a circle, get exposed for enough time and length with the cooler temperature, it cools down, it comes back to the heat exchanger, and then it gets the heat from the heat exchanger and it cools down the house. So it can be used as a cooling system or it can be used as a heating system for the houses. This is basically how the uh, horizontal system works. In the case of the uh, vertical system, uh, this is generally used for the larger or commercial buildings, okay, for the, for bigger facilities like schools, like church, those kind of things. Uh, these are suitable in areas with a shallow soil or where uh, trenching would disrupt existing landscaping. Okay, in a vertical system, then basically we just drill vertically. So. Remember, what we wanted to have is the contact, right? We wanted to have this contact between the hot formation or cold formation with this antifreeze fluid to warm it up or cool it down. So you need to have a contact. And this contact can be achieved if uh, you have a space, if you have enough space like back, big backyard in your, uh, you have a house with a big backyard, then you can just dig in and put that system in a horizontal section. But if you don't, and you're in a condensed area, still you need to, have to get that exposure of the fluid to the formation temperature. So you go vertically down. So this can go from 100 feet to 400 feet down. And uh, this would be, again, the, 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 the structure of how, how it works. So in a vertical system, 
holes are drilled uh, about 20 feet apart. So the, the distance between these two are 20 feet apart. And then they go 100 to 400 feet deep with two pipes forming a loop connected at the bottom. So these, these are connecting, they're connected at the bottom, okay? And then, uh, and, and horizontal connections are basically used in trenches link these vertical loops to the building heat pump. This is basically the second. So the, the technology is the same. It's just uh, to get that exposure, if you, if you have the area, basically you use it as a horizontal because then you don't need to do 400 feet. But if you don't have that area, then you have to go vertical down, then you drill 400 feet. So these are the cases that we use the ground temperature, uh, formation temperature. This can also be done uh, in the ponds or lakes, okay? If you have a nearby body of water, okay, that can be cost effective, uh, options uh, for the geothermal system, we can use it. In this case, uh, what we are doing, we are just uh, merging those uh, pipelines, let's say eight feet down into, into the pond or the lake. So a supply line pipe runs under the ground from the building to the water, forming the coils at at least eight feet below the surface, okay? Because if it comes to the surface, then you might get a problem of freezing, okay? So it has to go under the surface to prevent freezing. So coils should only be placed in water sources, uh, which again, they need to have to meet some minimum requirements. Let's say the volume of the water should be big enough. The depth of that pond should be big enough. And, and the quality of the water and the, the temperature should be such that the heat extraction from the pond or the lake becomes uh, feasible. Again, this is basically the same as the previous two cases where this can be done in a horizontal or in a vertical, okay? And then uh, the, the last option is the open loop system. So uh, this system basically utilizes well or surface body water as a direct heat exchange fluid for the geothermal heat pump. Okay. So in this case, you are not circulating the fluid. You are just using the same water. In, in the three cases that we discussed in the horizontal, vertical, and the pond, we have that anti-freeze fluid that we are injecting through these loops of the pipelines. And that is going to extract heat and then bring it to the heat pump. But in this case, you are producing the hot water from the formation, it goes into the heat exchanger, it cools down, and then we are injecting it back to the, wherever we are extracting the water from. So after circulating through the system, the water returns to the ground through a well, which we call it like a recharge well, okay? Or surface dis discharge, okay? Again, this is a possible if there's a sufficient supply of clean water uh, because, uh, Again, remember here, we are going to use exactly the same water that we have to go to the heat pump and we're going to extract that for our uh, heating and cooling system. So these are the uh, four and, and obviously the, the hybrid is also one of the options, you know, uh, depending on where we are located, the combination of uh, every one of these can be used to for this shallow closed loop geothermal systems. Uh, the other uh, closed loop system is called the deep closed loop or deep uh, closed loop geothermal system. Again, as we said, this technology uh, involves the drilling a well, but this time not few feet or few tens of feet. This time thousands of feet or ten thousands of feet of well needs to be drilled. And then what we do we are going to uh, inject the fluid. So in both of these uh, cases, except the open loop, uh, open loop, shallow, closed loop system, uh, open loop, uh, shallow geothermal system, we are not, uh, in the closed loop, we are not letting the fluid 
to get out of the well bore. Okay, so everything is in the well bore. So the fluid stays in the well bore. So how does it work? We generally start injecting. Okay, we are injecting the fluid. It really depends on what type of fluid we are using. We can inject the fluid in the casing. Okay, the fluid goes down. It gets in contact with the formation. It warms up. And then when it warms up, we can produce it from the tubing, okay? Or if you use other type of fluids like the CO2, we can do reverse, we can inject it from the tubing, it goes down, warms, goes to the, and then it will produce from the casing. So it really depends on what type of system, what type of uh, fluid system we are using. In this case, which basically the cold CO2 is injected through the tubing, and then it comes back and being produced from the second tubing, okay? And then the casing is basically filled up by the brine, basically, which is coming from the formation. So there is a well bore, and then there is a brine which is warmed up by the formation, comes to the, comes to the well bore, and we have one and the two tubing, which basically we inject C2 in one, it goes to the other one and then gets in contact with the brine behind the tubing, warms up and it comes to the surface. We extract the heat and we recirculate the CO2. So this is basically one configuration of the deep closed loop, okay? As we said before, uh, in the case of closed loop system, the problem uh, or the physics is the heat conduction, okay? We are not producing hot water. We are not producing any fluid that needs to be moved from the injector and the producer in the reservoir like the traditional uh, co or conventional hydrothermal systems that we discussed, okay? Uh, so the design relies on the conduction of the uh, to transfer energy. Uh, it's it's different than the traditional geothermal and the uh, hydrothermal systems because in those cases the convection is the is the driving mechanism. The fluid has to move from one location to the other location, gets warmed up, and bring the energy to the surface. Here, nothing goes into the formation. Okay, and that's basically one of the things that people are saying about the advantage of the closed loop system. There are two types of those, a deep closed loops. There are two types of deep closed loop system. Uh, one could be a U-shaped and uh, one could be a coaxial. Like in the previous image, we were looking at the coaxial case, but this can also be used in a U-shaped well, or, which again, there is a U-shaped well drilled which we are injecting the cold water from, or the cold uh, working fluid from one end. It goes to the formation, warms up, and then it comes back from the other. So there is uh, absolutely no fluid leak off or fluid transport to the formation. Everything is in the closed loop system. The two common working fluids used for this system is water and the supercritical CO2. These are very common, okay? Uh, briefly, why supercritical CO2? Uh, this is again going back to phase behavior 101, which basically, we are, if you are looking at the pressure versus temperature diagram of the pure CO2, we can define where the CO2 can be solidified, where it stays in a triple point, where it has a properties of all three solid liquid vapor, the CO2 can coexist on a three phase or it can be on a vapor pressure line where the CO2 can coexist as a liquid and a vapor. And at any point in this uh, green box, above what we call critical temperature and critical pressure, the CO2 will present a property of what we call supercritical behavior. Uh, supercritical CO2 is very important uh, because even if you are talking about the carbon capture and CO2 sequestration, we are using the supercritical CO2. We are converting the CO2 that we captured from the air or we captured 
after the combustion or the pre-combustion and we are condensing that, increasing the, its pressure and the temperature to get into the supercritical state. Why? Because the supercritical C2 has much higher density, okay? And that basically helps us to increase the amount of uh, CO2 storage. The same is here. They're using a uh, supercritical CO2 as a working fluid because uh, it has a much less boiling point than the, than the water, okay? The differences, uh, if you use a water in the closed loop, uh, the water undergoes a phase change. So when we are using water, there would be a phase change between the water liquid and the vapor. And this phase change obviously requires heat. So some of the heat will be lost due to, due to this phase change of water, okay? Which basically this impacts the efficiency of using water in a closed loop system. Uh, one good thing about it is a high thermal conductivity and it's environmentally friendly. But uh, the other problem with this, with the water is uh, the, the scaling. Depending on the water composition at different pressure and temperature, when it gets in contact, like the water form with, with it, when it gets uh, contact with the other materials or when the pressure and temperature changes, depending on the cations and anions in the uh, water that's been used for this uh, closed loop system, it may, it may start generating scaling, it, it may start uh, generating some corrosion issues. And uh, from the facility perspective, generally the closed loop water heat exchangers are much bigger, okay? Size-wise, they are, they are much, they're much bigger. And uh, this basically increases the cost, okay, of producing energy using the water. Remember, everything that we do, we're going to perform the economic analysis on it. We're going to look at the LCOEs and LCOS to come up with the uh, value of the energy that we're producing and the cost of that. If you use the supercritical, uh, the good thing about the supercritical is there is no phase change. So when there's no phase change, there's no energy loss, okay? Therefore, it gives you a higher efficiency. It does have some lower thermal conductivity, but uh, and it operates at a higher pressure and temperature. But that's also the supercritical CO2 is also environmentally friendly and it allows more compact system designs. Generally, the CD systems uh, running with the supercritical CO2 are more condensed. And uh, the way it works is basically you have the CO2 supply. It goes to the pump, injected with a higher pressure, and moves down. The brine, which is coming from the formation, comes to the well bore, and then the CO2 goes from the inner pipe, comes out. This is the cold CO2 comes out. As soon as it comes out, it gets involved with the brine, which is behind the K behind the tubing. It warms up, it comes back, and then it goes to the system for the heat exchange and heat extraction. And the brine is simply being produced and then disposed in the pond or somewhere. Uh, so there are some parameters that we are interested in the case of the closed loops. Uh, these are uh, generally, obviously, the first thing is the geothermal gradient or the reservoir temperature. For heat generation, we need the mass flow rate. We need to see how much mass flow rate we can provide. Uh, in, in most of these uh, geothermal systems, as an engineer, what you are measuring is simply the flow rate at the surface and the temperature. Okay, that's what you care. You don't care out on the ground. Is it the closed loop? Is it a uh, deep closed loop? Is it the traditional? Is it the enhanced geothermal? Can you get enough flow rate with a good temperature. That's that's the major thing. But in the closed loop, and in most of them, we also need to, to look at the rock thermal conductivity. This is another important issue that the uh, parameter that we need to investigate. The inlet temperature and the outlet temperature, obviously. And then uh, to have that working fluid warmed up enough, it needs, again, it needs to be gets in contact with the hot fluid or formation, right? So 
it's very important to know what would be the extent of that horizontal. If I'm going to have a horizontal uh, coaxial closed loop system, what's the extent of that? And then obviously the borehole diameter is important because that defines the maximum flow rate that you can get. So if I'm interested to generate five megawatt hour energy or 10 megawatt hour energy, obviously I would need different flow rate that obviously requires different borehole diameter and uh, and stuff like that. And the depth is, a, is another one. So this is a study by now at all 2005, which give you, gives you some information regarding the parameter domain. What's the minimum, maximum, let's say, ma flow rate that we are looking at? For example, this is the fast uh, mass flow rate of 5 to 100 kilogram of uh, fluid per second is, is the amount that we are talking about. Now, what's the depth? Like around 1,000 to 5,000 meters, right? These are, these are the depth. Did you want gradient, the borehole diameter? So this basically gives you a good understanding of these parameters. Comparing uh, the uh, conventional or traditional hydrothermal with the CO2 closed loop. Uh, in the conventional, one of the concerns is the permeability requirement. You obviously need to have a permeability or natural fracture system that can generate this connection between your injection and your producer, producer well. There would be some water loss because when you're injecting and these are all the naturally fractured it's it's not guaranteed that all the water goes to this system to this well one some water might go this way that's why some people they they drill another producer here and then the water can be recovered from both sides but it's still there would be some water that can get lost in a natural fracture system and if you get the water lost, then you have to provide water to come up with the flow rate required. So there is a continuous make of water requirement. And uh, heat production is directly related to that injection production volumes. Going to the closed loop geothermal system, it overcomes uh, some of these limitations uh, regarding the subsurface permeability and water availability. You don't need that. You don't care about the permeability because as long as you have enough contact of your well bore and the hot formation, you're done because you are injecting the cold water or cold fluid, working fluid goes to this pipeline. It doesn't come out of the pipeline. So you don't need to worry about the flow rates. Here you need to worry. You need to make sure that the, there is enough conductivity between these two to produce, but here not because it's just the water is just, or the floating fluid just passes through the pipeline that you generated. Okay, and there's no loss of, there's not much of loss, you know, of the working fluid. So you don't need to worry about the continuous making up. Okay, but uh, uh, the, the problem is uh, here we have a convection because the fluid is moving into the formation, the convection heat transfer versus a conduction because here have a conduction, the, term, the temperature has to be conducted the well board. That's basically one of the major things. And that's basically why uh, there's, there's discussions that people, some people say that why deep closed loop geothermal is guaranteed to fail. They say it's guaranteed to fail. Why? Because they say that uh, comparing this with the traditional, these are based on the conduction and the conduction is a very, very slow process. And uh, thermal diffusivity is also very, very slow process. So uh, when we are looking at the cost and the production, they say it doesn't make sense to use the closed loop system, okay? And uh, there, there are a bunch of studies in, in that line, which were saying that the closed loop system might not be efficient, even if you try to advance the drilling and reduce the cost, okay? So they say the cost can come down over time. However, the problem is that the physics fundamentally puts a limit on the ability of the system to extract energy. This is quoted from the Mark uh, McCurr from the rest frac and they they had different studies they have a software for the uh geothermal simulation which you can which you can visit their website and uh we are 
the end of the session we still have a couple of states left which i'll leave it for the next session uh, where we are starting discussion of the energy enhanced geothermal systems and uh now i open the floor for the questions uh, let me see on the q a or in the chat and uh, let's see if you have any question okay so Muhammad says, from what I understood, the deeper we can go toward the earth core, the higher temperature it will be. Why don't we drill much deeper hole to get more sufficient temperature instead of using another fluid with a low boiling point? It's cost. It's, it's, it's cost. Basically, you, you are looking at the drilling cost. And uh, you see, if, if it makes sense... And if you have the, the technology to drill the well deep enough and then use it. If you see that there is a there is another fluid that can be used. For example, this project that we are working, we are thinking of even if we can use the water, we want to think we are thinking of using supercritical CO2. Why? Because uh because it's a credit. There is a whole discussion on uh, what we call carbon credit. If you can capture CO2 from the air, from the atmosphere, or from the combustion, from the coal-fired power generation, energy generation, or anything like that, you collect that CO2, you compress it, make it CO, make it supercritical CO2, and then if you can store it somewhere, taking out of these carbon cycle, then you can get the credit. For every tons of CO2 that you can capture or you can store, avoid it from getting into the atmosphere, you can get one credit and uh, you can sell actually that credit in the carbon market. So exactly like what we are, why we are doing CO2 enhanced oil recovery, we are capturing a CO2 injecting in the reservoir that helps to increase our oil production. Also, we can get the credit because we are avoiding the CO2 to go to the atmosphere. So it's all about the, in this aspect, it's about the cost, okay? Of uh, which technology is uh, cost-effective, more sustainable, and has less risk of the operation. Any other question? Okay, you guys have been quiet today. Um, I'll, I'll leave. I have a few slides uh, left uh, to end this session, which I will leave it for the for the next time. We are, we're going to go over the enhanced geothermal systems, different type of that, and then some case studies and the steam-assisted gravity drain. Uh, sorry, SAGD is the steam-assisted gravity drain. And we're going to talk about the stage half and puff uh, technique uh, next Tuesday, same time. And uh, if you guys don't have any other question, uh, I'll end the session now. And uh, I hope to see you guys next week. And as I said, the recorded version of this will be provided uh, by Dr. Ahmed.